everybody. This is Stephanie Rupert. Thank you for tuning in to the Meaning of Everything podcast, where we entertain actually revolutionary ideas. Today is episode number 26, and I will be speaking with Professor Harry Collins, who argues that we need science in order to help preserve democracy. So Harry Collins has some really cool ideas. He works with a group obviously, and I encountered him. He is a social scientist of science. He does the study of science, and I encountered him a few weeks back, actually. It was only quite recently when I heard him give a talk at Oxford, and he discussed his whole history in in the field and in studying science and watching how society has changed over the course of the last few decades and recently then has come to the conclusion that something that science and democracy actually share values and that we can use science as a way to help preserve these values in democracy. Now I know saying values might sound kind of dry or boring, you know, value, what's value cares. It's not particularly flashy, but values are the thing that hold societies together. Values are the thing that make the things that make life meaningful, right? They're the things that you care about. And so this is a very interesting argument. And Professor Collins, Harry actually proposes that we develop a institution, an institution of a, a way of sharing science or what the scientific consensus is with policymakers in order to preserve the values of science in the policymaking processes and in our broader society as a whole. It's all very fascinating and very important, I think. I, I feel compelled by the idea. I think he's right. And it ties in a lot with conversations we've been having recently about trust and society and what we need in order to preserve our hope that as a species, we're going to do okay. Uh, so I'm very excited, very excited and honored, very excited and honored to have him on. I'll read you a little bit about him. He's one of those professors who's such a big deal. He doesn't need a significant biography. So the bio on his faculty page at, the, at Cardiff University, he is a professor of social sciences and was elected a fellow of the British Academy in 2012. That's a big deal. He has written for over 30 years on the sociology of gravitational wave physics, among other things. That's his whole bio. I can tell you a little bit more. Uh, he has written at least 25 books in the study of science, so many articles, countless articles, and has received many honors and awards, of course, most especially the being a fellow of the British Academy. That's that's pretty cool. It's a pretty big deal. And again, his ideas have been really important and very transformative and I think in some ways are, are quite visionary. And so it's, to reiterate, an honor to have him on. As ever, if you have any questions, concerns, comments about the podcasts, do be in touch. You can contact me a number of different places. It's Stephanie Ruper on Facebook, on Instagram, can see how to spell my name from the description of this show. And please, please do comment, like, share all the things, and feel free to send me an email at tmoeverything at gmail.com. Okay, so thank you very much. Without further ado, here is Professor Harry Collins. Okay, hi, Professor Collins. Harry, how are you? I'm fine, thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, thank you. This is the earliest I have actually ever, earliest in the morning I've ever recorded a podcast. Oh, really? Well, it's late for me. I get up very early. I had a sneaking suspicion when I gave you a 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. block and you picked 9 a.m. I was like, oh, he's a morning person, <laughs> um, which is great. I, I love it as well. But usually I podcast with people in the States. So um, they need it. They need a little bit earlier. So I have my I have my coffee. Uh, we're going to be, we're going to be good to go. Um, so I'm wondering, I'd like to 
I'm wondering if you could give us a little bit of an overview. I know that you've been in the field for decades and done a lot of very important things in the field for decades, uh, but I'm wondering if you could just talk about what you're most interested in or passionate about right now and, and why, you know, why are you working on these things? Why do you, why do you think they matter? As I get older, I understand better what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. So I've been giving some talks recently because I'm now quite old. And I've been giving some talks recently in which I've discovered the easiest way to explain what I'm doing is, is kind of autobiographical. Um, and um, let me say that where I started, I can see the, I mean, the starting point of my career was the first lecture I ever went to in sociology when I realized this is the subject for me. The second crucial moment happened in 1967 when I, for various contingent reasons, I read a book called Peter Winch's, by Peter Winch, called, a philosopher, called The Idea of a Social Science, mm -hmm. uh, which introduced the philosophy of Wittgenstein to me and made me understand that sociology could be understood uh, through the eyes of the philosopher Wittgenstein, uh, the notion of forms of life became crucial then i stumbled into being a sociologist of scientific knowledge mm -hmm. and now i realize that everything i've done in the sociology of scientific knowledge has really been informed by this idea of forms of life which pulls it all and holds it all together mm. and just to show how old and sort of circling back my career has been this is my latest book can you just about see it on the screen there I can. yes and i love that cover and it's called forms of life uh, and it's a methodology methodological introduction to sociology okay. so um it's it's kind of all come around full circle um and um what does it mean well to to be interested in forms of life to be a sociologist of science interested in forms of life um, it fits very well with Thomas Kuhn's idea of the notion of paradigm. As soon, when I read Thomas Kuhn's book, uh, which I did, I don't know, sometime in the 1970s or late 1960s, I suddenly said, oh, this is Wittgenstein applied to science because it's the idea of forms of life applied to science because of paradigm. That's interesting. Life. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I actually bumped into Kuhn and told him that. Um, and he kind of half agreed anyway <laughs> all right and um uh so what i'm interested in what i've been interested in is how scientific knowledge is made by groups and communities of people mm -hmm. uh in the 19 early 1970s i did some of the very early work in the sociology of science the empirical work in the sociology of scientific knowledge showing things like well you can't prove to everybody which scientific fact is right and which scientific fact is wrong just by going and replicating experiments because if somebody does an experiment which proves something different to somebody else's favorite hypothesis they'll say oh you didn't do that experiment right mm -hmm. and you know experiments are very difficult to do most of the time they don't work so you know you have to have some other understanding of how scientists come to an agreement about which are the correct experiments which experiments are working properly and which is the correct fact so that's where i came into this whole thing mm. uh, and then another uh, so i did a lot of work of that sort as uh, i uh, stuck around with uh, gravitational wave physics for about 45 years and was lucky enough to have been right embedded in the community when the first gravitational wave when it was agreed that the first gravitational wave had been discovered um, I've written a whole series of books about that and um, but more recently uh, certainly from about the turn of the millennium um, I've been interested in saying now look you mustn't draw the wrong conclusion from the sociology of scientific knowledge mm. science is e extremely valuable and central to our societies even though we can't really show that it always reveals the truth with complete certainty and even though there are possibilities for different groups of scientists to argue different conclusions mm 
Yeah. So then, so what is, what is it that people are saying about science now, or what are people thinking? And I mean this both, I know this is a big question. I know this both, I mean this both in the academy and in popular culture, like what, what is the popular view of science? And then I think, well, we can get into unpacking a little bit later, what's so wrong with this view of science. Well, going back to the 1970s, which was remembered just after the 1960s, right. um, it was very, very exciting time. I mean, you're unlucky because you're too young to have lived through the 1960s. If you lived through the 1960s, it's, it was a remarkable time. You could believe anything in the 1960s. <laughs> you were entitled to believe anything. Uh, Carlos Castaneda was invented. Uh, mm. I, I mean, I, I always as a, as a, provide a kind of iconic view of what was going on then by a fact that a perfectly respectable psychologist called Charlie Tart from UC Davis published an article in Science saying that there should be an entirely separate self-contained scientific paradigm for people on LSD. <laughs> okay. And he meant it seriously. And Science, which is one of the leading science journals in the world, published it. You know, right. this could be taken seriously. Okay. So you could believe anything. And one of the things we were doing then that was very exciting at the time was showing how not to take science as seriously as it had been taken for decades. Mm. Particularly after, uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War. I mean, science was enormously, science was unquestionably the, the pinnacle of, of human endeavour. Uh, science, physical science had just won the Second World War with the atomic bomb and radar and various other such things. And what we were doing in the 70s, which remember was just after the 60s, was to try and show that in fact it was not so clear that science was this leading cultural endeavour and that you could, in the, one of the popular words of the time, deconstruct it. And um, then this, of course, obviously, people, uh, at least a certain groups of people or, uh, or large groups of people, have used this to feed in to a kind of anti-science attitude. Um, C.P. Snow wrote a famous book called The Two Cultures, where he showed how the sciences and the arts were at loggerheads. And I think a lot of people from the humanities took up this new view of science to um, mount anti-science attitudes. And you can see a direct line from there, I think, to today's uh, alternative facts mm -hmm. and post-truth situation. So the switch that, you know, I, the switch that I made, switch in direction of my work to say, look, in spite of what we've said about science in the 70s it's still an extremely central and valuable part of our society we were saying that for the first paper was published in 2002 but all of a sudden unfortunately it's become very germane um, to argue for the value of science in spite of what was discovered about science and the ideas that were developed about science in the 1970s and thereafter I've, I've, I've always found that very fascinating. There's almost a sense in which people, we didn't understand how central many science and specifically, I think you talk a lot about the values of science, right? We didn't really understand how central these things were to the functioning of our society, right? And so you're sort of deconstructing science and saying, oh, you don't need to pay attention to it. Like it's its, its own thing, whatever. And then all of a sudden we see whole systems start to crumble and that's in part because there's it's just a deeply embedded complex institution science right and i think that that's why i have been so um, enamored when i became so enamored with your work when i encountered it because I, I think that we really do need to understand how much these values are wrapped up in science yeah well i mean 
I'm a sociologist and one has to be sociological about one's own work um, and about the whole sociology of science. So the, the sociology of science of the 1950s, uh, the key name there was a guy called Robert Merton. And Robert Merton was interested in the values of science. And Robert Merton was interested in the values of science, of course, because Robert Merton was interested in fighting fascism because that's what he, he and that generation had just lived through. <laughs> so that generation loved the values of science. And now, I mean, you know, we're, you can see what I'm doing is returning to the same point, but in a slightly different way. I mean, Robert Merton tried to argue for the values of sciences in roughly the following way. He said, well, look, the democracies won the Second World War because the democracies had science and the democracy science flourished better in the democracies uh, because the values of the democracies encourage and support science so merton was saying so those va values must be good we're arguing something slightly differently nowadays we're arguing no the, you know you don't need to do what's called solving the naturalistic fallacy by saying the values of science are good because we won the second world war just say the values of science are good because they're good <laughs> you know a value like universalism and being ready to look for evidence those things are just good would you want to live in a society where people's views were judged on the color of their skin or their religion or would you like to live in a society in which people's views were judged on their intrinsic worth you know would you like to live in a society where people looked for evidence and reported it as honestly as they could with integrity or one where the truth emerged from celebrities and the powerful mm -hmm. uh, and you don't need to say anything about the value of science you just need to say look those values are better aren't they gee if you don't think those values are better how can i argue with you you want to live in a society where what counts as the truth uh, is comes from the degree of celebrity and the degree of power well i don't want to live in the same society as you yeah it's it's very it's very fascinating there there were these endeavors where we were uh, there's almost a sense in which we over intellectualized so many things right and and i think deconstruction is very important but we end up in these traps of what we i think would colloquially think of as really intense relativism right or um postmodernism or post post postmodernism or whatever it is people are calling themselves these days um sort of this this post-truth era uh, whereas there is a sense in which we can just sort of agree that trying to be as unbiased trying to be as unbiased as possible is important right trying to be objective and trying to be universal with our understanding of rights and all these sorts of things so would you say that there is this sort of human ability to agree on basic values that help us live good lives and function well together? Well, I hope so. Um, okay. Look, I think that the intellectual arguments that were mounted in the 1970s that eventually led to postmodernism, I mean, some of the postmodernism stuff went a bit too far in my view, but the intellectual arguments and the empirical work that was done, I think was all good. And one of the things we've tried to do is not go back, not say, no, that stuff was wrong. That stuff was, in, as an intellectual movement very interesting and exciting and you know it was it was valid as it were a lot of it was valid but that the conclusions that people have drawn from it are not incorrect because when you start to look and now this is being forced on our attention in a way that we wish it it wasn't being forced on our attention by kellyanne conway talking about alternative facts and etc etc you realize how much these ideas of where you get knowledge from are crucially important to the way to the kind of society we want to live in um, can people agree well if they can't agree that shall we say some basic value like if they can't agree shall we say that the gratuitous torture of children is wrong you know if people say well you can't prove that to me 
so I don't agree with it. And I'm going to go and gratuitously torture some children. If you encounter that kind of thing, the only thing you could do is use force to try and stop it happening. You can't, you can't argue about it. You know, if people think they need an argument, a lot piece of logic or rationality to prove that the gratuitous torture of children is wrong, well, you're already lost. So I think we have to believe that there are certain self-evident moral values and that people believe in them. Otherwise, I don't see how society could go on. Mm. So what is the relationship of science to these values then, right? Is, is science sort of always or necessarily wrapped up with values that are important or does it sometimes exhibit value, you know, things that aren't variable that we shouldn't value? Can science actually be something that helps us embrace values that are important? Okay, well, it's, it's, there's not an easy answer to it. It's, it's complicated. Um, because quite obviously, scientists and science can do some pretty evil things. But the argument that we mount, and it's, it's in this book, actually, can I show that yes. to your, this is, this is the book in which we try and work all this out, which is a, a big long list of scientific values. But what we mean by scientific values uh, uh, is not the values that scientists just happen to have on a day-to-day -day basis because you know there are all kinds of there are scientists who cheat there are scientists who are only interested in their careers and there are scientists who are interested in supporting evil regimes uh, and there are scientists who aren't very good and so forth but what we're saying is that there are a set of values which are intrinsic to science that everybody who calls themselves a scientist must hold to for example if I make an observation and I see what the outcome is, it's intrinsic to doing science that I'm going to report the results honestly. If I report the results just to suit what I prefer to happen, I'm not doing science. Okay. I might still be called doctor or professor so-and-so and so-and-so. I might still be in a white coat. I might still be publishing in the journals and publishing false results, but I'm not doing science. It's an intrinsic part of science that you report your results honestly. Otherwise, you're just not doing science. And so we list a whole list of about 14 values, which are an intrinsic part of doing science. And in another place, you know, I've written a whole lot of things that scientists do that are typical of science but aren't intrinsic to science so for instance consider Stephen Hawking's book a short history of time a brief history of time of which millions were published it's on millions of people's shelves none of them understand a word of it that's got nothing to do with science okay it's something else it's it's very much more like I don't know something like the Latin Bible or something it's much more a kind of religious act to publish a book like that. You can't say that publishing that book is intrinsic to science. Take that book away and science itself would be no worse off. You know, uh, it might be a bit less popular among people who like to read, have a, obscure books on their shelves, but it's not science. And then, then you get people saying they've looked for the microwave background and they've seen the face of God. Well, you don't need that in science. You don't need to keep saying, I've seen the face of God. That's not an intrinsic part of science. And then you get people who do startup companies and make lots of money out of patented, patenting new kind of biological, what's it? I don't know what they are. That's not an intrinsic part of science. You could take all that away from science and you'd still have science. And you could go on listing all lots of things that scientists often or typically do, take them away. And it wouldn't damage science proper itself. But take away honesty in reporting your results, you haven't got science any longer. Take away the belief that anybody can come up with the truth irrespective of the colour of their skin or their ethnic background, and you wouldn't have science any longer. 
take away the idea that I should try and corroborate my results by repeating the observation. You take away that idea, you haven't got science any longer. Take away the idea that if I can find a way of saying how my results could be falsified, it's better. Take away that idea, it damages science again. So you see what we've done, we've taken some of the standard ways in which in the 1950s and so forth, people tried to justify science, like Popper invented the idea of falsification, falsi falsifiability. And we said, no, that's not a logical part of science, but it's a crucial value of science. Mm. So not every scientist has to be doing that all the time, but a good proportion of science, scientists have to be doing it a good proportion of the time for this activity to be called science. You see, it's a sociological definition. It's a form of life. This is what science is, this is a form of life. It's characterized by these values. And there, as I said, we list about 14 of them. So the book that you held up for people who weren't, aren't watching the videos on YouTube is called Why Democ Democracies Need Science, right? Yes. Okay, so knowing this, knowing what we know about science, what you've just said, why do democracies need science? Well, it turns out that that, the set of values, the set of say 14 values or so that you can, you can uh, say are quintessential to this form of life called science, have a strong overlap with the set of values that characterize democracy. Mm. Uh, and so we say science can actually lead democracy. It's a strong overlap. It's not a 100% overlap. There are things that democracies need uh, that aren't quintessential to science. I mean, for things like um, voting for your leaders every few years. That's not part of science. Science doesn't want that as a value. Okay. And there are things that science has um, that democracy uh, doesn't need uh, something like um, what well, oh, I don't know I can't think of something off the top of my head I'd have to look at the book but there's they're, they're listed there's a nice little diagram which shows where the values overlap and where they don't overlap now the problem with as we see it with uh, democracy as we encounter it today is that all the old institutions and professions that used to help maintain those democratic values are getting more and more battered and eroded mm. by free market capitalism. Take the banks as an example. Once when I was a kid, my mother used to tell me that the banks were totally trustworthy. And she gave me an example of a friend of hers who worked in a bank and had to spend all night, uh, one night, searching for a mistake of a half penny in the accounts because the accounts had to be perfect mm. and you knew if you went and had a conversation with your banker there wasn't the slightest chance that they'd do anything that wasn't completely honest so banking at that time was helping to bolster democracy because the values of the banks overlapped with democracy as well but nowadays the values of the banks don't the values of the banks now are all about making money. I've had to leave, shift banks twice in my career. For instance, once I had to shift, shift bank because by accident, I became overdrawn in my current account by um, some very small amount. And as a result, I got a huge bill, a kind of mafia vig type bill for going over overdrawn slightly um, for a couple of days because they hadn't sent me an account and I didn't know it was slightly overdrawn. And I got in touch with them. I said, look, if you don't change your mind and rescind this bill, I'm going to leave you. And I had at that time a lot of money in the deposit account, a lot of money. And I spoke to somebody in the end who, who some I phoned up and I spoke to somebody in charge of this business. I said, look, I just accidentally went over there 
a tiny amount and now you're charging me 90 pounds that's a totally unjust isn't it he said you know it's your job to work out keep an eye on your account we're not going to do anything about it no you're, we're going to charge you so i took all my money out of that bank and put it into another bank and it's clearly this guy was presumably earning commission and he was just earning commission to make gouge as much money out of the customers as possible and there was no morality there whatsoever so banks forget it and we know that that's just me but of course the 2008 crash i'm just at this moment rereading the rather nice book by uh, michael lewis called the big short uh and what's that film is it's a was wonderful film and you see there is no honesty there whatsoever in the banks there's no there are no values positive values left in the banks and you go through institution after institution and you see these values being eroded and so that means the values of democracy are being eroded now the reason why there's hope in science is because the values are intrinsic to science in the way that i've explained in the way that they're not intrinsic to banking you know you can gouge that 90 pounds out of me and still be said to be doing banking whereas those values of honesty and integrity can't be relaxed in science and still be doing science so i think that science may be democracy's last hope you know in britain we have the another wonderful institution which really helps to support democracy it's the national health service i had a feeling but it's getting <laughs> pardon i had a feeling that's what you were going to say yeah i mean it's the national health service is getting battered so far it's resisting um the national health service goes this country is going to be in serious trouble but science i think is sort of universally an institution which could potentially have the power to lead democracy and i would say that the piece of science that i know best which is the detection of gravitational waves which i stuck around with for 45 years exhibited those values wonderfully well um, i know not all science exhibits those values i know there's lots of or a certain amount of cheating and a certain amount of self-interest and so on but that certainly that 45 year project to detect gravity gravity waves was one of the things that led me to this position to the belief that science could lead democracy because of its values mm. but the science of gravitational waves does that it's not politically contentious right and so no. it's is it at all easier for people in that field or does it draw people who are not interested in having some sort of other agenda right and i i think i think what people have now with all of this radical distrust of governments and organizations and institutions is people think that everybody has their own agenda and scientists are going to have their own agendas in things like econometrics or climate change right because those are those are complex and the answers you know are, are not easy to talk about and i think as you have said uh it's always wrong <laughs> in in a lot of instances um the science of the economy is always wrong but so how do we sort of talk about these values or convince people that these values are real in sciences that are much more politically relevant okay well you need to separate out a few things first of all let's go back to gravitational waves the point about gravitational waves is it's as you might say a kind of ideal type of science it shows what science's potential is as a resource for values it shows what science can be and you can you can understand i think from the argument why you would think science ought to be strong because these values are intrinsic to science so let's take econometrics which is all which is a, a nice example because it is pretty well always wrong okay that that do you see that the change that's being argued here is not to value science because of its success but to value science because of its values and that means that we have to keep valuing science even if it is always wrong now a much more dangerous argument is that there are certain sciences which are closer to the political world where you can't trust them to maintain those values because they're 
there's too much political influence on them. But even that's not 100% true. So let's take econometrics, for example. Can you imagine an econometrician saying, this is my analysis of where next year's economy will go. And the reason I've come up with this analysis is because I am politically conservative. No, they wouldn't say that. Even if it was their underlying political conservatism that was leading them there, they'd never say they'd got to it because they were politically conservative. They'd say because we've observed the data properly and we've done the analysis correctly. So you see the values of science coming through even in a politically fraught situation like that. Now, the question is, in a situation like econometrics, yes, there's tons of scope for other kinds of values to filter in and affect what the scientists actually come up with. Um, but this is where the we invent a little institution which we think would help feed scientific understanding into democratic societies. And we call this institution the OWLs, which is why that book, I'll show it to you again, has got an owl on the, well, can you see it? It's got an owl on the cover of it, okay. And the, the idea of the owls is that it would be a committee, there'd be a committee. Say you've got some controversy, it could be the econ controversy over next year's inflation rate and predicted inflation rate or employment rate, the sort of thing that econometric modelers try and come up with. So you would have a committee. It would be made up of, on the one hand, scientists, econometricians, uh, and you'd look for a certain kind of scientist. You'd look for a, a, kind, a certain kind of scientist who'd read a few books about the sociology of scientific knowledge and understood what typically sociologists say about this kind of thing, about science, and would be reflectively self-conscious about the possibility that uh, political interests might be guiding the way they were doing their science. So you'd have some of those, and then you would have some actual social scientists of, of my kind, where you're a social scientist, but you're not some, you know, um, two cultures, science wars kind of social scientist. You're somebody who can see the world from the scientist's point of view, as well as the social scientist's point of view. And the job of that committee would be to look at the question on the political table and uh, provide answers of the following form. One, what is the scientific consensus on this matter? So if it was econometrics, it would be, what is the scientific consensus on what next year's inflation rate will be, um, what next year's employment, unemployment rate will be. And secondly, and this is crucial, what is the strength of that consensus? And if it was econometrics, I can tell you, the strength of that consensus would be a grade E. You'd grade strengths of consensus from A to E. In gravitational waves, the consensus at the moment about whether gravitational waves have been discovered would be a grade A or A minus, because there are some people who are disagreeing that they've actually been discovered and say it's all a mistake, but there are not very many of them. So it would be a grade A. But if it was econometric modeling, it would be a grade E, you'd say. And this would be extremely important because you would, it would be, become evident that politicians could, if it was a grade E consensus, could not use that consensus to justify their policies, which is what they did in the Reagan and Thatcher era. They said all the economists agree that this is where the, you know, this is where the economy is, and we haven't got any choice but to make these policies. It wasn't true because the consensus was never strong enough, and econometrics was never strong enough to justify those political choices. So they would have to make their own political choices and make it clear to the electorate that they were political choices and not try and dodge the political judgment by saying they're forced on us by the econometric models. So Wait. that's what the owls would do. Another case would be Tarbo and Becky and his decision not to distribute 
antiretroviral drugs to pregnant mothers in South Africa way back about 10 years ago. Tabo and Becky said, we're not going to do this in South Africa because there's a scientific controversy about it. The owls would say, no, there isn't a scientific controversy. You can find a controversy on the internet, just like you can find an anti-vax controversy about MMR vaccine on the internet. But actually, there's no real controversy in the scientific community. There's complete consensus that these drugs are safe and efficacious. Just like there's complete consensus that MMR vaccine is pretty safe and efficacious. And then Tarbo and Becky would not have been able to say, we're not going to distribute antiretroviral drugs because there's a scientific controversy about it. He could have said, we're not going to distribute our antiretroviral drugs because they're too expensive and because we don't want to become under the under the thrall of western pharmaceutical companies but he'd said he'd have to say that was a political decision not a scientific decision and by pretending it was a scientific decision he was actually disenfranchising his electorate because you can't vote against a scientific decision but they could have voted against it if it had been clear that it was a political decision or they could have voted for it so the crucial thing to understand about the owls is that the owls don't make policy. They only say what the scientific consensus is and how strong the scientific consensus is. And then the rest of the policy making and political procedure proceeds as before. Mm. Um, I seem to remember you saying that the owls would be selected by, but very carefully by some sort of committee or what have you. But I, I have wondered, right, the Supreme Court, for example, in the United States is supposed to be very unbiased, right? And now people don't, people don't trust the Supreme Court. We all know that everybody in the Supreme Court has a very specific political agenda. And so I'm wondering how we keep the owls from skewing the picture, from, from presenting some sort of bias. and maybe like is it the scientific community that helps elect an owl or is it a political party how does this process sort of keep itself as grounded in values of science and objectivity as possible well it's a very good question and it's one for which there will never be a, a, a complete solution because it goes all the way back to plato whose famous statement chris Custodia ipsos custodienses, who guards the guardians. So whenever you've got a committee like this, you've got people somehow or other the members have to be selected. And if the people doing the selection are not themselves honest uh, and unbiased, then it's going to be biased. So all what all one can say is, yeah, it's always going to be vulnerable to this kind of problem. All you can say is that this may be an incremental step better than what we have now. Um, and you'd have to take various kinds of safeguards to make sure that the owls didn't come under the thrall of politicians in that kind of way, at least not grossly. And I, I, quite honestly, I haven't got the answer to you about exactly institutionally how you do it. The recruitment to the owls is a, gonna be a difficult problem. And it's going to be a difficult problem to solve. And I don't think we've completely we've solved it yet. But the point is to say, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't throw the whole idea out. If you think the idea would work in principle, surely we can find people ingenious enough to make it work a bit better than it, things work now. I mean, it's not a completely new idea. Uh, as somebody pointed out to me when I was last presenting it, it's not, the owls would not be hugely different to the International Committee on Climate Change. That's the same kind of institution. But here its role would be more explicit. It would be more explicit that it wasn't making policy and it would be more explicit that it can, can include a certain kind of social scientist. And it wouldn't be so different from, shall we say, we have in this country um, uh, what's called the government's chief scientific advisor who has to be selected in some way in an unbiased way and seems to be selected in an unbiased way. They choose a scientist who has a broad understanding and is well connected and so on and so forth. So it's possible 
to have institutions like this without them necessarily being biased. We think the ALS is a bit like the chief scientific advisor, except that its role is much more carefully set out and understood. And therefore it would be politically more legitimate. We also say that it should be a formal part of government, this committee, so that politicians couldn't just dismiss what it came up with. Politicians, that, that its role would be to stop politicians distorting the view that emerges from the scientific community. That's what its role would be. And therefore, it needs to be a formal part of government. Are there any specific political problems that the institution of this institution could help remediate or would be most obviously beneficial for? Well, I think it would be, it would be the sort of institution that would stand in the way of, oh, to, to trivialize people saying the uh, inauguration crowd was bigger for Trump than it was for Obama. Yeah, that's just an alternative fact. You wouldn't be able to have somebody saying, here's an alternative fact. It would be the owls who said what the scientific consensus was. If somebody says, I've got another idea of what was going on there, then they would be in opposition to this formal part of government called the owls. And, you know, you won't stop people saying that, but one hopes they'd have what they said would have less legitimacy. And it would stop, I, as I gave examples earlier on, it would stop things like when uh, various politicians saying, this policy isn't a choice, this economic policy isn't a choice, it's forced on us by the scientific consensus of the economists, the owls would say, no, it isn't, because the consensus is too weak. Or when somebody like him, Becky says, you know, we can't distribute antiviral drugs because some of the scientists think they're dangerous, the owls would be saying, no, they don't. That argument is long over, it's past its sell-by date. This is the consensus now. So everywhere where politicians tried to make an, a false statement or a, st a, a crucially self-interested statement about what the scientific consensus or scientific view was, the owls would be there to prevent that having legitimacy. I recently spoke with a social psychologist. His name is Eric Kuglansky, and he's brilliant, and he works on questions of close-mindedness and how we become so extremist in our views and polarized and follow emotional argumentation, fascism, fake news, that sort of thing. And he argues that something we once had and, and lost is trust. And I think that that sort of speaks to what you were saying earlier about the banks. Because there was this shared value of objectivity, there was some kind of trust, it, some sort of community understanding. And so I see the owls in a way of being an effort to restore restore some sense of trust that we have in governance and therefore being able to help us revalue, right? Revalue truth. Or I think people value truth, but we don't know how to find it. And so this will sort of give us an avenue to find it, right? Well, okay. So I wouldn't, I mean, first of all, what, what you and, and your colleagues say about trust is absolutely right. And one of the things which a so sociologists know enables science to work is trust among scientists. Take away the trust and you can't have science. I mean, if you think about it, every single scientific measurement depends on a huge network of trust of people who've made measurements before. Otherwise, you wouldn't trust the instruments and you wouldn't trust the previous work that you're basing it on and so on and so forth. So trust is absolutely crucial to science. So science, again, is an exemplary institution for showing people how trust works uh, within a, a society. Now, yes, we're losing we're losing people's trust in science and one of the things we we want to do one of the things we think we need to do if we're going to restore the kinds of democracies we want is to get people to start trusting institutions like science and uh, medical medical profession and so on start trusting them again not trusting them as blindly as we used to in the 1950s a critical trust okay but nevertheless it's no good dismissing them completely, otherwise the whole society collapses. 
so that there's got to be trust again and yes the owls could do it but i mean we shouldn't be too ambitious because there are always going to be conspiracy theorists there are always going to be and more and more people battered by social media with all kinds of strange stuff on it i mean social media is a real problem uh there are going to be social media as we see bolsters the sort of demagogues that we see coming to power more and more and more but the owls could be it's not going to be a panacea but it could be one more institution that helps to guard against this and re-educate uh, provide some civic education in which institutions you should put a bit more trust in and which institutions you should put a bit less trust in that's what i would see it to doing if it worked that's a beautiful idea i think that's a lovely note to end on we're starting to have colleagues knock on our doors so it might be a good time to go um, i'm wondering if you have anything else you'd like to say or books you'd like to recommend anything any sort of last notes people listening uh no i hope everybody will re read my account of the discovery of gravity waves is called gravity's kiss <laughs> and seems to be doing quite well um and it the, the point about it is uh, apart from being quite an exciting read because the discovery of gravity waves was an extraordinary scientific event but it also shows how a good sound scientific community works it took them five months to decide that they had discovered gravitational waves, even though within two days they were pretty sure they had. But they did five more months of work before they were ready to announce it to the world. And that's how science should go. So it's a good example of how science should go. Should go. Uh, the book Why Democracies Need Science sets out the things that have been said here pretty well. Um, and uh, well, I've written about 25 books or more and um, they're all great. <laughs> I agree, although I've read two. <laughs> I'm extrapolating from my data set. Um, <laughs> okay, lovely. Um, thank you so much, Harry. This has actually Thanks. been really, really great. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay. okay, thanks, Stephanie, for, for the idea, and it's really nice <laughs> to meet you across the airwaves. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, take care. Okay. Um, okay, so I can I can cut it um, anywhere. So I'll just find, I'll, my editor will find a place to just cut us off when we were saying bye a hundred times. Um, but actually, genuinely, thank you. Um, this is, this was, the conversation went precisely how I had hoped. Good, I enjoyed it as well. That's, that's terrific. Yeah, I, this is a great idea. So I'm gonna do what I can to get it out there. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, as ever, uh, let me know if I can, you know, do anything and I'll let you know when this is live. Yeah. And I can, I can, I can, uh, pull it up and look at it. Can I? Yeah, of course. And send it, send the URL to other people. Yes. That is how social media now works. <laughs> Horrible stuff, better. social media. <laughs> I agree, but you know, I have to, I have to use it to fight it. So you have to fight back. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Okay. Okay, cool. Stephanie. Have a lovely Bye. day. Bye.